everybody, I'm Maria, Director of Development here at the Seward House Museum. Thanks so much for joining us for our first live video. Um, we hope that you are having fun at home, social distancing. We are doing the same thing here at the museum. Um, so I'll be behind the camera for this virtual tour. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in. And then as we go from room to room, we'll try to answer those for you. All right, let's get started. Maria. Hello, Jeff. So this is Jeff, our Director of Education. And hello to everyone watching at home. Uh, I thought since we were hopefully getting a diverse audience, everybody is in the same situation, we do something sort of fun as we experiment with this live stream series and do a bit of a lighter take uh, on uh, Seward stories. People who visit, we try to give them a, a pretty serious, but, but um, I think often fun, narrative that encapsulates the life and legacy of William Seward and his family. The questions we usually get are about all the stuff. Uh, and so for my first uh, live stream lunch tour, I thought I would go and I've selected a handful of paintings and photographs, images only. And if this is popular, people like this, we can do it again with objects uh, and sort of shed some fun light through the portraiture and paintings of the Seward family that, that tell us some, some of the fun uh, anecdotal stuff about them. So we're in the parlor of the house, one of the, one of the most opulent and grand rooms where the family would have entertained. Uh, we usually begin our tours here with visitors, and uh, you can imagine um, how awe-inspiring it was to walk in from the front door and to see the framed art, the piano, the table, everything set just so. Uh, and one of my favorite all-time Seward stories is about a very basic picture. Uh, this Henry Inman painting. In the uh, age of the Sewards, um, born in 1801, he passes away in 1872. And for the uninitiated, uh, a New York State Senator, New York Governor, U.S. Senator, Presidential Candidate, and Secretary of State, um, Seward uh, was Governor of New York from 1839 to 1843. And when he was preparing to retire from office, one of the last duties that fell to him was commissioning his official gubernatorial portrait. I know what you're thinking. If you've been to Albany and you've been to the Hall of Governors, you think, oh, I've seen that. It's grand. It's wonderful. That is actually not the official uh, governor's portrait. It's on loan from this house. It's been there since 1849. Uh, but through uh, Seward's time as governor, the official painting didn't go to Albany. It went to New York City and city council. The official painting is still there today. So William Seward had a tough decision on his hands as time was running out of his governorship. Friends of his, like Thurlow Weed, his campaign manager and all-purpose advisor, are putting the final touches on his administration, uh, and they're thinking, who should paint this portrait? Seward is still a very young man in 1843. He's about 42. As you can see here, this is a gubernatorial era Seward. Uh, lively, red-haired, youthful in visage and appearance. Uh, and he and we did something that was not uh, uncommon for them. They're looking, looking for the best value. They did something similar when commissioning the New York library system, invited publishers to submit sample libraries. They invited about five artists to apply uh, to, to prove that they their talents were worthy of capturing Seward. And quickly from five down to two, a pair of strong, perhaps the leading American portrait artists of the 1830s and 40s emerged as the front runners. Uh, their names were Henry Inman and Chester, I'm sorry, yep, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not sorry, Chester Hardy. Uh, really interesting, and they tell us a lot about American art history in the early middle 19th century. Most American artists were self-trained, self-taught, both of these men were. I'm going to compare them a bit later to some of the European artists we have on display here. Uh, and Inman, born in 1801 in Utica, New York, uh, uh, studied as a young man under an itinerant artist, uh, an Englishman named John Wesley, uh, and got pretty good. He's widely considered the superior of the two artists, though a short career. He dies in 1845, so not, not a very long career. Uh, and Chester Harding. Harding is born in 1792 in Massachusetts, lives into the mid-1860s, and paints quite a few iconic pictures. In fact, this is a Chester Harding, Seward's political mentor, John Quincy Adams. 
Elijah Miller. This is a Harding. So these two artists won Seward's favor, and to be fair, and he had a lot of time on his hands, in the summer of 1843, he was out in the governor's office. He's still five years away, six years away from going to the U.S. Senate. He invites both artists to come to this house and spend time with him over the summer, several weeks in residence where he sits for the painting. He's a practicing lawyer at this time. The house is very busy and full of life that summer. Seward's father comes to visit. John Quincy Adams comes to visit. The family's preparing to send Augustus off to West Point. Harding comes first, and he and Seward really hit it off. I want to describe, uh, just kind of read from notes, only because I want to give you Harding's words. What it was like to be here. Describing Seward uh, to, to a family, he wrote, to begin with, his head. Aquiline nose, blue eyes, reddish brown hair, very agreeable manners. The governor has resumed his practice at the bar as a lawyer. He spends his evenings at home in the library, where we'll go next, which is very extensive, talking and smoking. I now have one of my cigar, one of his cigars in my mouth, and a good one it is. Seward Humidor. Uh, Harding also gets to know Francis during this time, with a lovely painting of Francis. And he writes, Madam is very beautiful. Black eyes, dark hair, fine figure, very modest, very intelligent, has read a great deal, and talks politics almost as well as her husband. Seward loved having this famous artist here every night. He's having dinner parties. These two men are cut from the same cloth, very social, very gregarious, and he enjoys having Harding to stay. Likewise, when Harding leaves and Inman arrives, Seward enjoys that too. Inman, I want to quote from him, from him as well, uh, enjoys making Seward laugh. Uh, and the family, as they were watching Inman's painting come together, said that the smile on Seward's face that he paints in was so genuine, it so perfectly captured the expression Seward would make when he was engaged in conversation with you. Spoiler alert, this is a study of that painting. Perhaps Maria can show you the face. So you can see the, the tugging of a smile around the lips there. And he does something interesting. He paints Seward in a white cravat. Religious men in Auburn, who were watching this painting come together and, and meeting this great artist, Inman, said, oh, Mr. Seward, are you adopting the theological style? No, he replied, I prefer the black cravat, but Inman won't paint me in it. That's right, Inman said, I never paint a man in a black cravat. On canvas, especially with a dark background, it always appears that the head is cut off. So, the white cravat. Seward was presented the final products. Here's Harding's. This is what you see in Albany today, and if, Maria, you can uh, zoom in on this if you can. Harding's and Inman's. This is a, the one you just saw was a study of this one. The family agreed that Inman's was very good, uh, maybe better. Harding's was more flattering, maybe a little more handsome, Mr. Seward here, and looks kind of grand, almost militaristic with that cape and that, that very dramatic backdrop. He simply couldn't decide, and so, it fell to the artist to do something rather unusual. With Seward split between both, it was suggested that they toss a coin. So Inman and Harding gather together after that summer. Inman reaches into his pocket, which I have a coin, pulls out a half dollar and tosses it and invites Harding to call it. Harding says, tails, it came down heads, and that is why this, the Inman, is the official gubernatorial portrait, and Harding's is not. It all came down to a coin toss. Well, I promised to show you the library. Let's go in there and see that. And before we go any further, let's introduce our viewing public to our new Director of Collections and Exhibitions, Emily Kraft. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to be in this position. Uh, you might have recognized me from our administrative and uh, visitor engagement coordinator position, uh, but my real passion really uh, lies with uh, collection and research. So, so glad to represent the museum in this way. So Emily's going to join us for part of the tour today, and I'll talk some history, and she'll sort of show you into the toolbox what it is a director of collections does in handling and caring for some of the paintings uh, that I'm going to discuss. And 
a relatively new piece to us, a non-collecting institution, right behind us over the fireplace is one that Emily herself actually uncrated this summer. It's a really cool story and it's the only oil painting we have of Senator Seward. So we saw the Inman painting of Governor Seward looking quite youthful and red-haired uh, in 1843. Here's Seward in about 1856, so about a decade and a half later. Hopefully, as you can see, the red hair has begun to gray. There's a, still a bit of a playful smile going on in Seward's face here. Uh, and this was commissioned by a friend of his named George Washington Patterson. Uh, it actually is a painting with history that dates back to uh, Seward's uh, governor era. Uh, he runs in 1838, wins, and serves two terms. He would actually run before that in 1834 33, loses. And in addition to picking up the law to make money during that time, he also is hired out by the old Holland Land Company, uh, which asks Seward, has got a big name, he's a young man, and has a growing family to feed, to move to Chautauqua County, New York, and handle some disputes between settlers and tenants and the land company. He's got the, the prestige and the clout to do that. So he goes, uh, and he has a fairly nice time, though Francis is less than pleased to have Henry out of the house again. He spends his winters reading uh, Bacon, Walter Scott, Charles Dickens, uh, takes care of the business and the, the, the uh, legal aspects of the land company, and uh, will actually, in many ways, sort of train his own apprentice. Seward is, it seems, forever grooming uh, protégés. George Washington Patterson is actually a bit older than Seward, 1799. He'd go on to become a lieutenant governor of New York, with Seward for the founding of the Republican Party, he attends both the 1856 convention and the 1860, which was presumed to be Seward's to win, uh, controls the ports of New York, becomes a congressman, uh, and in 1856, as Seward's career is ascending and Patterson is sort of rising along the way, uh, he pays for a Scottish-born uh, Scottish artist excuse me, named John Phillips, who had a studio on Broadway in New York, to do this painting. Uh, Emily, what do you want to talk about? Uh, sure, so I'd love to give some insight on what it's like when we do receive uh, a piece that has been given to the museum. Uh, just as Jeff said, we are uh, non-collecting. So we're Historic House Museum. Uh, all of the contents uh, that we have in our collection really came with the house. And over time, we have accessioned some pieces, uh, but this really was a piece that we got uh, most recently, and I don't know that we'll see anything for a while. So we have a pretty strict uh, collection, collecting standard. Uh, so anything that relates to the four generations of family directly uh, is what we mainly take in. And if we do take in any types of materials, uh, we might accession them into our education collection so that uh, Jeff and our education and outreach coordinator, Zach, might use them as practical and real examples of 19th century uh, decorative arts materials. Uh, but what it was like to unframe this uh, was quite amazing. Uh, so we received this in uh, a wooden crate. And so anytime that we receive or a send out a loan, uh, we would put it in a wooden crate and it was supported by uh, foam padding. So the crate was a little more uh, than the size of the painting itself uh, and it was in there uh, quite safely so there was no way for the painting to move around and then we would open up the crate uh, and reveal the wonderful painting it was just amazing to see Seward staring right back at you and uh, the gilt frame the gold gilt frame is it's amazing it's in such good quality the owner that had this uh, clearly took a uh, good care of it as you can see and we'll discuss more about this uh, the life of paintings and uh, the uh, status of them, you can see that it is in quite good shape. Uh, it doesn't have any warping or cracking like you might see in an oil-based painting. So it really is in uh, quite good shape and uh, it fit quite well here in the library and it was uh, quite amazing to uh, reveal this painting to the public and have uh, this wonderful connection and again, since we don't accession pieces a lot, it's uh, wonderful that we were able to get this. Maria, were there any questions coming in from viewers that Emily or I might be able to help with? 
Uh, no, no questions so far. Just some people joining in. We have somebody from Mexico. Hey, Jude. Hi, Hi Karen, Jude. Riley. So lots of people joining in. But again, everyone, if you have questions as we go through the different rooms, just type them in and then we'll try to answer them. Yeah, keep those questions coming. Ah. Start them coming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Emily's going to come visit us again later. Before we leave the library, there are two uh, photographs that I want to call your attention to. The first right here. This is an 1864 carte de V uh, from the studio of Matthew Brady, signed Abraham Lincoln. And above this very special library, anyone who's been to this house knows it's one of the coolest things we have, Fanny Seward's library. There's a Matthew Brady photograph circa 1856, uh, Senator Seward and his teenage daughter, uh, Fanny. Uh, and beneath it is Fanny's uh, girlhood library. Sadly, Fanny dies at age 21. Matthew Brady was a fairly famous photographer, even in 1856, uh, when Seward comes to, know him, comes to know him. Born in the 1820s, uh, he learns uh, the arts of the daguerreotype under no less a person than Samuel Morse. Uh, and in the 1840s, opens up a studio in New York. He travels to fairs and conventions. He uh, produces miniatures, uh, images, photographs, working with dry plate, early, early stuff of men like James Fenimore Cooper, Edgar Allan Poe, and in 1859, I think it is, he opens up a studio in Washington, D.C., and he captures the likes of uh, James Polk and Zach Taylor. Must have been earlier to have gotten Taylor, so uh, let's, let's say um, maybe late 1840s then, uh, and captures political figures and, and American, you might, you might say celebrities, men, and uh, men, uh, pretty much exclusively, of, of letters, but you can see in the business of doing family portraits as well. Now, Brady is perhaps best remembered today for what he does during the Civil War era in which Seward and Lincoln uh, work so hard together for the cause of union. Uh, he sends a team of photographers to battlefields and does something quite remarkable and dramatic to bring the realities of this grim, grisly, and bloody war home. A war which will ultimately claim nearly three quarters of a million American lives. He goes to Gettysburg, he goes to Antietam, and he and his team of photographers capture the full scale and scope of devastation before any of the, you might say, cleaning up in the aftermath of, of the carnage can happen. So he actually photographs these scenes while the corpses of the slain remain uh, spewed across the field. Uh, and he puts together uh, an installation exhibition on the Battle of Antietam. The New York Times uh, credits uh, uh, more than anyone else, uh, Brady, for bringing the realities of, the, of this war home to bear. The Times writes, Brady doesn't actually bring the bodies of the dead and stack them in front of our doors, but he essentially does that in these, these stunning photographs. The media talked about these images more than almost anything else. Uh, in terms of reportage of the war. So you can Google these images. They're still very hard to look at. Uh, and I think we're, we're, we're lucky, we're fortunate to have Inman's and Harding's, more artists we're gonna talk about, but these Brady photographs are, are exceptionally um, historically relevant uh, and meaningful. Speaking of that Civil War era, nice transition, Jeff. We train our docents and interns to have transitions like that. Let's go see another one that harkens back to that time. And Stephen, to answer your question, how old is the house? It was built in 1816. So we have the original part of the house over here, uh, 10 rooms, and then later additions in the 1840s and 1860s. In the Civil War, uh, as, as all um, eyes of the country turn to the battlefields, it's an, it's an all-encompassing total war every part of society is affected, uh, the eyes of the world turn as well. And it actually falls to William Seward to, uh, to be in constant contact and conversation uh, with peoples from across the world. His, his primary task under Abraham Lincoln as Lincoln's Secretary of State was to assure global neutrality, to get the messaging out there and write with international leaders and the diplomats and legations that would come to Washington uh, and among the countries paying attention was Switzerland, which had had its own civil war in the 1840s when a number of Catholic-leaning cantons had hoped to secede and, and form their own distinct uh, government against the centralizing Swiss state. 
uh, they're defeated, and as the American Civil War progresses, uh, the Swiss government, uh, led by liberals, uh, commissions an artist named Franz Buscher to travel to the United States and create a masterwork, a mural-sized painting uh, to hang in Bern. Uh, he comes in 1866, a year after the war is over. He Americanizes his name, starts going by Frank, and Frank Buscher is a really fascinating artist. Look him up. You can Google him. He spends five years living in the United States. He's our first European artist we're looking at today. Uh, born uh, in, um, I want to say the 1820s, uh, he studies in an academy, San Luca in Rome, he goes to Florence, he's schooled in the classical style, he loves big, bold, sweeping colors, as you can see from this painting, I've yet to identify, but this is a busher, uh, and uh, they call him a realist and orientalist, sort of mixed together. Uh, and he uh, paints about 300 total oil paintings in his career, many of them uh, from his American tour. Arriving in the United States, Busher's given incredible access to many of the leading figures from the Civil War. And early on, the war over, Busher changes tack. Rather than create a mural valorizing heroes, depicting battle scenes, he wants to capture the key individuals who were involved. And he actually paints the very last portrait ever done of Robert E. Lee, who insists to Busher he wants to help bring the country back together and overcome, as he puts it, the sores of war. And so it becomes about collecting individuals, documenting more than making a political statement uh, about the war. Uh, he's able to paint Andrew Johnson, Lee, as I've mentioned, William Tecumseh Sherman, William Seward. In fact, one of the people who won't let him uh, paint a portrait of himself is, is Grant. Grant doesn't want to do it. And there, there are, there's some hesitancy among others uh, with concerns like Lee's about how this will, this will affect the, the public imagination and memory of a war that's still very fresh and very painful for a country trying to, 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 to reunite. Seward uh, is involved in two paintings from Busher. The one that we have in our collections is right here. It's from 1869. It's simply called Janet on Horseback. Maria can show it to you. The horse was acquired by Seward in 1859 as he, he traveled the world, an Arabian horse. Janet on the horseback is uh, Mr. Seward's daughter-in-law. She marries his son, William Jr., in 1860. Uh, by their pet goat, you can see the first two of three grandchildren uh, that, would, that would be Stewart's. The girl, the taller of the two, is, uh, is um, Cornelia. They called her Nellie. And then there's William III, who appears to be dressed as a girl, uh, as a very young boy here. That was a part of the style of the time. What I wish I could show you instead of this, although this is a really wonderful painting and allows us, we always try to be mindful that we're not just here to talk about William Seward, but uh, the entirety of his family and, and multiple generations. Busher also paints a portrait of William Seward himself, and it is extraordinary. So uh, before I actually move on to that, I just want to mention, so as we move from room to room, I'm here to really talk about our conservation and preservation efforts of uh, specifically painting. So we have a lot of three-dimensional items, uh, but we also have wonderful paintings. And it's really a nod to uh, Seward and the appreciation he had of, of art and good art and uh, really employing these artists. And uh, this piece in particular actually was conserved in 1997. So I'll be showing examples of paintings that need conservation and paintings that have actually already been conserved. So this was conserved uh, by Westlake Conservators. It's located right here in central New York in Skinny Atlas. And uh, I've actually toured uh, the facility myself and it's quite wonderful what the conservators do while they're there, the chemicals, and they're very, very well skilled. Uh, but this was conserved in 1997. So as you can see, there are some darker elements to it. And so every you know, 20 or 30 years, it is something that we will have to revisit. Even though it has been conserved, you will start to see these elements of discoloration, uh, as I said, warping, uh, cracking, all of those things. But this is in good condition because of that prior conservation. Uh, but to speak to what Jeff had mentioned, uh, the painting, so we actually just received this. It's a poster, so it's not a collections piece. 
Uh, but it's a poster uh, given by a supporter of the museum. And this is Seward. Uh, we think either in the gardens here in Auburn or possibly in Washington, D.C. But he's standing there with his hand on his hip. Uh, you can see he's wearing his Panama hat. And there is a woman uh, in the back there. Again, we're not quite sure who that is but uh, we keep it in our staff uh, a break room now but we'd really love to possibly have the original on loan so again i said we're we're not taking in pieces very often but we are always looking to loan items and borrow items so uh, thinking about our national recognition and how we could incorporate this painting that's somewhere in an archive in switzerland uh, would really be wonderful and we have a couple of questions um Karen wants to know more about the Mahjong set. We'll get to that in the drawing room and we'll tell a little about the history of that set and give you a close up. Um, and then we also have another question. How much does a typical painting conservation cost? Uh, that's a great question. So as you can see, a lot of our paintings are oversized. I will show a smaller painting in a little bit. Uh, but they can cost uh, thousands of dollars, really. So because of the way that we operate and the funds that we have, we typically look for grants uh, to fund those opportunities. So I am rather new to the position, and I'm not uh, sure how these paintings were conserved in the past. Uh, but there were a couple in 1996 and 1997 on our database that have been conserved. So I would assume that we would ask for a grant uh, but depending on the size and also how stable the painting is and just the condition of it, it would vary, but at least uh, a couple thousand dollars. So pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And each uh, conservator, they actually approach the painting in, a, in different ways. So no painting is the same. And so they would really have to assess it first before they would give that value of how much it would cost. Great. Thanks, Thanks Emily. <laughs> And now moving, what, into the, the dining, dining room? room? Yes. Where am I going to stand? Maybe I'll stand right here for now. Welcome to Seward's dining room. If you haven't had a tour here or it's been a while, uh, usually an eye-popping room. It's beautiful in here. We do another one of these talks about objects. Emily and I can talk to you about China. I know uh, next week we're hoping to bring you, if we can, Another one of these that will focus on Seward's travels around the world. Many of the, the objects in here have an international provenance. Uh, but I want to keep going with our art and artist theme uh, and now bring up one of the bigger names we have here in the catalog, Emanuel Leutze. Really interesting guy. And if Harding and Inman were cut from a Seward cloth, boy, it was Leutze. Uh, born in Germany, classically trained, attends university in Dusseldorf to become an artist. Uh, he starts trying to capture great historical American landscapes. Uh, we think of Leutze most often for his Washington crossing the Delaware. Look at the size of this. This is, this is a sort of big muralistic type uh, painting that the Swiss surely had in mind. Romantic, powerful, uh, when they sent uh, Busher to the United States. Uh, Leutze uh, paints this in 1850 uh, and uh, establishes a studio in Washington by the end of that decade and comes to know William Henry Seward quite well. In fact, he painted Seward twice. Uh, we don't have either of those paintings in our collections. He paints them in 1859. Uh, uh, I've not seen it, but I can tell you that no less a person than Fanny Seward did not think it was the best likeness of her father. Uh, she criticized that it did not capture his eyes, his mild expression, his kindness and benevolence. Those were words that she chose to use. Uh, and then after, after Leutze's death uh, in, I think it's 1868, uh, there's a, another painting of Seward found in his studio. Uh, his greatest claim to fame is, of course, uh, Washington crossing the Delaware. In 1860, he paints Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney. And after that, he's commissioned to paint something for the Capitol. We'll, we'll talk about this painting in a bit, uh, but it's uh, basically one of the most iconic images of manifest destiny, Western expansion in the United States, uh, westward the course of empire. You can Google that, and, and you, can, you can see more examples of, of Lloyd's of paintings. 
Uh, he did a number of pieces for Seward, quite clearly, painting Seward uh, twice. In Seward's dining room, you can't leave a tour of this house without learning about Seward's daughter-in-law, Anna Seward, wife of his second born, and Assistant Secretary of State Frederick. This is an Emanuel Leutze painting of Anna, one of the premier high society hostesses of Washington, especially during Seward's tenure as Secretary of State, who helps him plan so much of his signature dining room diplomacy uh, style of politicking. Uh, we talk about that on a regular house tour and maybe find a cause to do it again for these live streams. Uh, and I like to say on my tour, I don't really know, but I like to say it feels like uh, this is in many ways a, a thank you and a tribute uh, to Anna for all the years of great good service that she and Frederick are living with Seward in Lafayette Square and maintaining the lifestyle he needs to be politically successful. In this room, we often talk about how it's around the dining room table that Seward wrangles the U.S. Senate into supporting his Treaty of Session, the so-called Folly, the Alaska Purchase, and Leutze would actually uh, commemorate that as well. We'll leave Anna the fan she's holding, a gift from a Japanese legation here in the shadow box, a woman of Washington and, and the world, of great importance to Seward personally and professionally, Leutze, who again was interested in these history scapes, captures the night, though he was not there, uh, March 30th, 1867, that Seward, seated in the State Department, uh, is deep in the throes of conversation with the uh, Russian ambassador, Baron Edouard de Stokel. They'll negotiate a final sum of $7.2 million for the transfer of what was then called Russian America, or Alaska, a place about twice the size of Texas. We know who everybody is in this picture and can on demand name them for you. But the key players, Seward, De Stokel, clerks and translators, and in the corner, uh, to the far right, that's Frederick Seward, his father's assistant secretary of state, and Charles Sumner, uh, senator, and chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. They would both have large roles to play, as would Anna, in getting this deal through. Now behind us, Another painting, and I'm going to tell you the history, and then we're going to talk more about um, uh, conservation. This is an incredible and large painting that Seward acquires in 1869. Two years after the Alaska Purchase, uh, Seward is traveling across the country. He goes to Alaska. Uh, he goes to Mexico, Cuba. Winters in Mexico, really. Uh, and that December, he spends time uh, in Mexico City, the Mexican Academy of Art, uh, Design. There are several stories about how he comes to acquire this painting. And there are so many mythologies baked in to a lot of the stories behind how did Seward come to have this, that, or the other incredible piece of history uh, given to him. Uh, and one of the stories about this painting is that Seward, who was in many ways a hero to Mexico, he didn't oppose the French invasion and the installation of, of Emperor Maximilian, was invited to go to the museum and pick something, uh, or he was just given this outright. The artist uh, is named Jose Pino, and this is a scene of uh, Dante descending into hell. Uh, and Seward was apparently so taken with it that as he travels through Mexico, he brings this with him, whether he's staying in hotels or private homes, he has this put on display wherever he is, and at the end of the trip, has it brought here. Uh, great. So this is an example of a painting that definitely needs conservation. So uh, the subject matter and the colors were intentional. You've got your dark reds, your oranges, your blacks, and your browns but it is quite dark because it's discolored. And so this has actually been on display since fall of 2017. And so right in front of it, uh, behind Maria at the camera there, we have two windows. And so being a historic house museum, this is not ideal for truly our whole collection, uh, but specifically paintings, they are extremely susceptible to uh, the highs and lows of relative humidity and temperature. And so if you've got an environment that's cold and dry, even in your personal homes, you should consider adding a humidifier, adding some more moisture. Uh, because the backing, the, the canvas or wood, whatever it may be, 
will begin to crack. But if you've got an environment that's warm and wet, uh, such as our summers here, we begin to see the temperature in the house increase, that will also contribute to uh, the aging of this. So proper storage, uh, proper light levels, that is what uh, is the key to really conserve your paintings because you'll start to see this very dark sheen on it and essentially the conservators would go in and they would first uh, use a mixture of chemicals to take off the original varnish and so a varnish is a clear coating that essentially seals in all of the paint and all of the elements so they would go in they would take that off since the painting is so old the varnish is very old and they would go in uh, they would fix any holes they would also do any painting, which is amazing that they have to match the color exactly, get the red just right, get the cream just right, and fill in those spots. And then they would uh, introduce uh, some new chemicals, a new varnish, and it would be considered uh, conserved. They would also go in and fix any of the cracking or discoloration on the original frame as well. And so I printed off a picture just so you can see and kind of envision uh, what it would be like if this painting was conserved and you would take off that outer varnish and really reveal a bit of a lighter painting. So this is not from our collection, but as you can see, the conservator right here has shown us a cleaned spot versus an uncleaned spot. So that's the potential that uh, many of these paintings have and uh, that's what we'd be able to do to further conserve it so that the dust and, and uh, materials aren't sitting on it and it's, it's being cleaned essentially. Great, thank you, Emily. Sure. Um, and we had one question about the china on the table. So this is called Old Paris. Um, so this is one of the sets that belong to the family. We have multiple sets of china in our collection. Usually we'll change them out each year to have a different set on display. But every Christmas, if you visited the museum, you'll see our French Imperial China, um, which is the dark blue and white here in this cabinet. And that was gifted to Seward from Prince Jerome Napoleon of France. Actually, that China was supposed to have been reserved for the royal family, so it's quite amazing to know and to think about the fact that Seward was given that as a gift. So we put that out every Christmas. But we're going to head on into the drawing room. You want to focus on the Mahjong set first? Oh, yes. Second? Yeah, let's that, that Pearl, look question. at the, yep, the Mahjong set. Just a little bit more information about the history and where it came from. Uh, so we know Seward does travel to China in his retirement. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, that this was not actually acquired by Seward. We can double check on Past Perfect and, and respond to you in the comments section. But I believe this was acquired by his son, uh, William Jr., later in his life, also a bit of a man of the world, uh, traveled internationally. Uh, Will Jr., also quite famously, we didn't point out the veiled lady, perhaps we can see her as we go upstairs, uh, is responsible for some interesting artifacts that belong in this home. I love pointing out, and perhaps next time I will, uh, these beautiful marble horses done by Edwin Landseer, English sculptor most famous for the Lions, Trafalgar Square. But we're sticking with paintings today. Uh, so Maria, I don't know if it's good. Oh, angle. and then just a follow-up question. Oh, yeah. The Mahjong set, is that ivory? Do we know? You know? Uh, again, that's something we can check, but yep. I would say most likely yes. Yep. Uh, but we will verify that uh, in our okay. database. Yeah, so most likely yes, but we will check on that for and you. If she forgets, you can email her at collections. <laughs> um, you have a good, uh, good vision here? Yes, we're uh, good. So a third painting by Emmanuel Loitza, another one we actually do have in the collections, is this uh, beautiful piece, uh, one of the last of Leutze's life. Uh, it's a posthumous painting of Fanny Seward. Now, Fanny Seward actually knew Leutze personally. Uh, back in the dining room, I was describing how Leutze was a great companion of Seward's, perhaps why there are so many Seward-Leutze connections. Uh, he loved to go partying in the, the social scene in Washington in the late 1850s, but the early 1860s as well. Uh, and Fanny actually encounters him at a party in 1863, it's January, uh, and she's uh, left to talk to Leutze for a while. And Leutze told her something quite interesting that day. 
that perhaps we should take into account as we present these pictures to visitors. Moitza urged her, and you can actually read this letter. Fanny writes it to her mother, January 23rd, 1863. You can find that on the great resource, the, uh, the Seward uh, Project. Uh, org. It's done by the University of Rochester, SewardProject.org. It's a letter Fanny writes to her mother, and she describes it. Loitza tells her the only time to really take in and see one of his paintings the right way was on a bright day, uh, to, to see all the details that he paints in. Fanny was apparently not all that impressed. I've mentioned she's a bit critical of the 1859 painting of her father. Uh, she goes to the Capitol in 1863 to see a Loitza painting, and is underwhelmed. She writes, the figures in it are not particularly impressive. You can read that letter, too. Um, but after Fanny's tragic death uh, in, in November 1866, Loitza finishes this painting posthumously. He had an appointment for a sitting with Fanny, and they had begun uh, this, this beautiful work. Both took ill. Uh, Loitza recovers. Fanny does not. And to finish the painting, Another woman, uh, perhaps Anna, poses as a model, one of the great beautiful dresses, which is still in collections, uh, this lovely white and purple. And Loitza famously paints into the, the canvas some, some clues that suggest it's po posthumous. And Maria can show you the pale and lifeless or, or gloved hand, depending on your interpretation. The season behind her, autumn, leaves falling uh, from the trees, a season of, of, of decay before rebirth. She's surrounded by dark, ominous, brooding clouds parting only into her eye line towards the heavens. Uh, I well, was mistaken earlier. It occurred to me I said we had two uh, Frank Bushers in the house. We actually do have a third. It's not nearly to the scale of uh, the Seward painting or the Janet on horseback, but this small painting of Anna in the back corner is another Busher. And I think I see Emily back in the room to talk to us some more. Hey, Emily. Yes. Hello. <laughs> to conclude uh, my contribution to this live stream, uh, I said I would show you a painting that has been conserved. So we did technically see that with Janet on horseback, um, but then we saw Dante that needs conservation. And here's a really wonderful painting of the gardens. I thought it was very fitting today for the first day of spring. Uh, so here's what the gardens looked like. This was painted uh, circa 1920. Uh, so third generation of family would have been living here. And Maria can show what the gloomy gardens look like now. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully yeah. in a few months, uh, we might be seeing the same uh, brightness and, and flowers and flourishing. But uh, to talk more specifically about the conservation, as you can see, uh, this is an oil painting, and Maria can really zoom in there. And again, this is one of our smaller pieces because we really have a lot of oversized paintings. And so I'll show you on the back. So when we do get something back from Westlake, they'll typically put this card on the back, and it has their name there so we can identify it. Uh, it, it tells us to keep all the information with it. And it also identifies uh, the artist. So this was done by Frank Barney. He's actually just a local uh, artist to Auburn. Title is Gardens at the Seward House, the dimensions, and again, it's oil on artist board. And then they would also uh, number the treatments here. It was done in May, 2006. So one of our more recent, which technically isn't that recent now. And then the materials they use. So again, they went in and cleaned it, like that little example I sh just showed you, and then they introduced uh, these new uh, final varnishes to, again, seal in, of course, all of the work that they did and uh, the wonderful result that we have. And, of course, I'm using my white gloves as I do, uh, so we either use cotton, white cotton gloves or powderless uh, nitrile gloves when we are handling um, any pieces that uh, need gloves. Well, okay. uh, I know many of our, our viewers today are feeling a little bit cooped up at home. We're all keeping, I uh, hope you've noticed, Emily and I have given each other a wide berth as we've moved through practicing our best social distancing. Uh, if you're watching from Auburn or within driving distance and you're looking for something to do outdoors, to take a walk, you might visit uh, Auburn's own Fort Hill 
cemetery, beautiful Victorian cemetery. Find the original, there are maps by, by the gates. You can grab, you can walk, you can drive. And if you find the Seward plot in the cemetery, you can visit a piece of brilliant American art. Uh, Leutze was multi-talented, and he also did headstones for uh, Francis and Fanny Seward. Sadly, Fanny's uh, was destroyed. It was an ivy-covered uh, urn. But you can still visit Francis's, and this is what it looks like. And for anyone who enjoys a walk, uh, I know that it sounds sort of strange to walk the cemetery, but it's, it was considered uh, when, when cemeteries were being opened uh, in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, like um, uh, Mount Hope in Rochester, uh, that these were places of being tranquility uh, and, and relaxation in an era before parks. You can visit Francis's headstone and know that you're looking at an American masterpiece. Uh, Maria, do you think our viewers would like to see one more thing upstairs? Any Commenters, or should we just yeah. do questions? Nope, I think we have time for something upstairs. One more thing? And um, Jeff, I was racking my brain trying to remember the company who restores old paintings. The one we mentioned that we work with is Westlake Conservators mm -hmm. out of Skinny Atlas. I don't know if that was what you were talking about. You're asking me? But, no, I was, oh. there was a question from another Jeff. Another Jeff, okay. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the old lady. And then Maria can take you upstairs. Oh. Climbing the stairs. <laughs> Maybe two. I'll do one real quick though. Okay. I know people are hungry for lunch. Maybe you're eating lunch while you're watching us. Up here in the Diplomatic Gallery, we're going to cut right in and visit the room of Elijah Miller. Now, you can't come and visit us. You can't go to the Met right now. But next time you do, visit Leutze, and you can also visit the Ami Phillips collection. He was a traveling itinerant portrait artist who found sort of a rebirth in terms of his legacy during the folk art craze of the 20th century. But he captured a young Elijah Miller in the pioneer days of early Auburn. You have to really be a, um, maybe an art historian uh, to appreciate that, that Phillips is actually a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty big name. And he would have been traveling through small towns in central and western New York and further west. And if you had the money, he would sit with you and you could do something like this. I've always thought that the desk that Miller, with his crazy hair and hair, is seated behind looks an awful lot, just from the corner, like this one. When it's opened up, you can see uh, a lot of the little uh, drawers and shelves. It looks very, very similar. But uh, out of Judge Miller's room, we'll go to the sewer room. And Maria can show you what's one of, actually one of the hidden treasures of this house. Tucked away in what we've uh, taken to interpreting as Seward's Washington bedroom is a beautiful 1834 Thomas Sully painting of Frances Seward. Uh, she is about 29 years old here, quite young. It's between the birth of her first son, Augustus. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Between the birth of her first and second sons, um, Augustus and Frederick, uh, and her first daughter, Cornelia. And uh, she went to the studio of Thomas Sully, who's an interesting artist. He's sort of halfway between being an American original and a European. He's actually born in Europe, but brought to America at a young age. Opens up a studio in Philadelphia, and by his account, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, responsible for about 2,600 paintings over a long career uh, about 70 years of painting. Uh, and in 1834, a young William and Francis just happened to be passing through. It's toward the tail end of Seward's career as a state senator. He's hoping to become governor that year. Uh, and he and his wife decide, setting out in late May, they're gonna go on kind of an American road trip. It's one of my favorite Seward stories. They take Frederick, not Gus, which was interesting. Gus stays here with Grandpa Miller, who would have looked like he did in Yami Phillips. Uh, and they go to the American South. They stop in Washington. They're received by Andrew Jackson. They go into Virginia. They visit Mount Vernon, which was not a public place, house museum you visit. Same in Monticello and Charlottesville. Signs of slavery began to build up, depressing William and Francis. They had intended to go all the way to Richmond, uh, but Francis 
decides she, she can take no more of this trip, which was also quite grueling. At a certain point on the carriage ride, the taverns run out and you're staying in private homes and travel was hard. They, they returned north. I think our signal is cutting out oh, a little. So let's yes. yeah, head back downstairs and continue talking. Up here, you back downstairs. Let's go downstairs. Okay. Yeah. So I think our signal was cutting out a little bit. So we're just going to head back downstairs. And then we'll have one more thing to share with you. So just to wrap up my story, they both, <laughs> William and Francis, visit Sully in his studio in 1834. They both sit for portraits. That's Francis's. Perhaps the most iconic Sully is this one of a young Victoria. Uh, beautiful, kind of caught off guard there, looking over her shoulder. This uh, is, is a beautiful painting, and uh, we're, we're fortunate to have Leutzes, Bushers. Uh, Sully is someone of great of great import as well. So when you come here, never be afraid to ask your docent, your guide questions. We try not to do object inventories by pointing out everything in every room, but we're always happy to tell you the backstories because clearly nearly everything in this house has got one. And it looks like Emily's got one more to share Thanks with you. you. So Karen, I was able to uh, look in our database uh, when I stepped away just for a minute. And so I wanted to actually show these tiles up close uh, from the Mahjong set. So uh, this piece was uh, cataloged as FIC or found in collection. And this pretty much means that uh, it was added to the collection without any provenance of where it came from. So many of the items are accessioned uh, with the date of 1951 because that's uh, when the home went from a, a private residence to a museum. Uh, but these were actually found in the collection in 2007. So uh, it is classifying these as wooden, and as you can see, the bottom base there is wooden. Uh, but it doesn't say that it is ivory, but it very much could be ivory, and it would be something that we would uh, look into more and do some research. But again, from prior uh, knowledge and prior notes in our database, uh, they're just classified as wooden. So just wanted to answer your question. <laughs> and thank you everyone, it's Maria again for joining along with us as we look at different artwork throughout the museum. Um, just a side note, any teachers or parents who are watching it or listening to this later who may be at home um, doing schoolwork, we did create a new virtual tour, just a general tour of the museum which is on video with an accompanying uh, a curriculum kit. So it meets the standards for fourth and fifth, seventh and eighth, and 11th grade social studies classes. So if anybody is in need of some extra activities to do, please email outreach at sewardhouse.org and we can send you some materials to take a virtual tour of the museum and do some activities to go along with it. Um, but next week, next Thursday, join us again at noon. We're going to look at Seward's travels. He was one of the first really um, world travelers in the 19th century, taking four trips around the world before, during, and after his political career. So we're going to take you again through each room and highlight some objects that he brought back from his travels and talk a bit more about the places that he went. Um, but just to conclude, please everybody stay safe, practice your social distancing. Um, as you may have heard, the museum is closed to the public right now, but we hope we can continue to bring these live streams to you at home. And if you would like to support the museum, because as a small nonprofit, we do rely a lot on our admissions income, which we're obviously not getting right now. Um, but if you are interested in making a donation, a contribution to the museum, you can either go to our Facebook page, hit the little donate button, or go to our website, sewardhouse.org. Um, but thanks again for joining in, and we hope to see you next week.